you're, you, you've always been helping the community, and that's the beautiful thing about you. And, and to be brave enough to change as much as you have, and also to give back. I mean, you've really been in the lives of a lot of young people. You have to, man. You know, that's why I think I'm still alive, because I should have been dead many times. And uh, I'm not a church boy guy, but I'm a god fearing man, you know, and he, uh, he, he really, he's been there for me, man, you know. So I think I'm alive now to tell the kids, like, do something, you know, yeah. just get involved with life itself, you know what I mean? Like sometimes I go speak to these juvenile halls and stuff, and I just want to see these kids who I saw in me, and I, 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 I know their attitude, I know who you, where you're at right now in your head, but I just want to like grab them, I want to, want to slap them, you know, like, <laughs> like no, really, it's like, be in white camp, just slap out of it, man, you dig what I'm saying? Because you're wasting your life, you really yeah. are, man, you know? Yeah, no, I, I was on a set, and a, a guy came up to me, it was, it was a slow guy, you know, little man, and one day we're, we're talking, he's like, you know, I, I die for my hood, I die for my hood, I die for my hood. And I said, so do you own your place? I goes, what do you mean? I go, do you own your house? I goes, no, man, I live in an apartment. I go, do you own your apartment? I goes, no, man, some Korean dude does. <laughs> I said, that Korean dude should be dying for your property. Because you're dying for rental property, that's not enough. <laughs> and he thought about it, he's like, yeah, you're right, Holmes, and I'm dying for... That's the whole point, it wasn't owning it. You know, but that's, that's the reason, because my mentor told me that, the same mm -hmm. thing, right? He goes, I go out there, the same thing, I was out there for my body and all this and that, and, and he goes, do you own it? He told me the exact same story you said. Oh, right? man. But good. you know what I did, though? Because yeah. thing was going good, I bought a quarter of a block of my neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so what happened there is that, so then in a way in my head, I'm going, even though I was really changing my life, I'm going, yeah, I do own it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I'm always kind of, I'm always kind of you know, trying to get on top, right? Yeah. And uh, but I lost it all 10 years ago in my divorce, you know, so there you go. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so there you go, you know, your wife's got it. You got a little, little life lesson on that one, you know. But it's so, it's so true. Yeah. You know, it's like, and you know what, so, it's just when you're living that kind of life, you're celebrating your death more than your life. You dig what I'm saying? You thinking, hey, when I die, man, you know, everybody's gonna come and visit me. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna be honest with you, I was a true blue homeboy. I had road dogs, man. And I lost them all. Either they're dead or they're washed up in Father King Bay. And um, I went to the burial, and I went and saw you again, put some beer on your grave, and I never went back again, because you know what life was on, bro. You know, mm -hmm. And I tell that to the kids because life was on. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, it is, it is, a, it is almost a celebration of death. It is that eat gate and that attitude yeah. stuff. But you've got to move it to something else. I mean, I'm telling that guy, and because my thing, I, I spoke at a, a juvenile hall, or, or uh, it was a prison actually with Danny Trejo. You know, Danny, yeah, yeah, of course. You know, he's a great guy. Great yeah, he's been on the show and stuff. Um, I was about to speak, and I'm looking around going, man, these guys are pretty tough. Uh, and I'm wearing a suit. So <laughs> I look like could be a victim. So, uh, I was telling, uh, so Danny Trejo sees that, he's with me, but he goes, Rick, you want me to uh, say something for you, introduce you? And I go, like, yeah, it takes me, I don't want to go out there quite yet. He comes up, listen to me, you know what, I've been, Pelican Bay is naming off all the places. He goes, you know something, this is the man to respect, he never was in prison. And everyone just shut up, and they listened, and they were so receptive, but I needed him to recognize me and me to recognize him. And what this show does is it's my way of recognizing you. I, I have loved your work from day one. I love working with you and every time I see your success, I'm, I'm proud. But I think of us, we were in Silver Lake doing a little show. Lexus Studios. Yeah, Lexus yeah, Studios, yeah, Silver Lake. Yeah. And you're telling me stories and I just remember that, you know, because I, I know your heart. So no matter how intimidating you looked, I was like, I know his heart. You want he wanted that role, and he's just done an incredible job. What's, when we see something next, what's the next? I, one? I, I I'm, I'm on a show right now called Z Nation every Friday night. It's a zombie show. I'm a zombie killer. I'm having the time of my life. I'm a little you know. But now I'm 55 years old now. What happens? Like we work long days, and I'm getting chased by zombies. I'm chasing them, and after about 15 hours, you're like, damn, I'm getting old for this. You know. <laughs> Let that zombie go. Don't worry about it. I'll catch up to you later, zombie. <laughs> I just finished another show, another series with Ron Perlman, who played Clay on Southern Anarchy. I play a police officer on that, Officer Kessler. And then uh, I'm leaving in two weeks to, um, Atlanta? to Atlanta to start another series. Uh, I play a cop on that as well, uh, uh, Saints and Sinners. And this time I'm a, well, I look like a saint, but I'm really a sinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
That's great. It's been great. Well, we're all proud of you here. This is your home. Oxnard loves you. We love you here at this wow. college. And thank you so much. <laughs> We're all going to have a discussion about politics, so let me introduce our panelists. This is Wendy Carrillo. She's a media personality, a public speaker, she's a communicator. She's one of the women that are really changing what Hollywood's about in the media. She's led and been a bilingual English Spanish spokesperson for media, grassroots campaigns, politics, everything. As a media showcase these issues, she's uh, had her own show called My People's TV. Take a look at this clip. <laughs> My name is Wendy Carrillo. I am a journalist, writer, blogger, photographer. I was born in El Salvador in 1980, during the beginning of the civil war of the country. My father became very involved and unfortunately lost his life. My mother and I fled the country and we ended up in East Los Angeles. two identities in East Los Angeles, trying to figure out who I was. In high school, I tried to join the Mecha, the Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Aslan. And the president asked me uh, what part of Mexico I was from. And I said, oh, I'm not Mexican. And she said, well, you can't join. That, to me, was like, okay, you know, what are we really saying? What are we really doing? Your community hour of power will be discuss issues that matter to our community. Storytelling was always just part of who I was. I had this natural ability to talk. I found myself at Power 106 in Los Angeles. I'm able to do this program that allows different voices to come on and, and share ideas and talk about the issues that are really affecting us. We started off the show talking about the Oscar grad case in Oakland. I had been asked by Big Boys Neighborhood to do some political you know, discussions about the midterm elections. And all of a sudden, the producer says, the president's going to call it. Oh my god. And I don't know where and how the question came to me, but I said, Mr. President. Mr. President, you said earlier that education is hugely important, and your uh, educational initiatives for Latinos and African Americans is a huge undertaking for the Department of Education. Where are the jobs for young people that are going to college or are interested for, to be able to compete in a global economy? Where are they? What are they? I mean, you're going to think what we know. I'm this girl from East LA who at one point in her life was undocumented. And here I am asking the president a question. Are you recording? Yes. Recording. <laughs> Take what you do seriously and to consider what the consequences are for people that are listening. You know, this is what it's all about. said this to me when I tried to apply. They're like, look at you, you're all well and stuff like that. We don't see you so enough for pressure or prejudice in your lifetime to join a movimiento to in Chicago. I'm like, Zolchi Milko, does right now count? So, it's a true story. So, uh, I mean, just be nice to all of us, okay? Because we talk about you on stage. <laughs> This next person on our panel is Ruben Navarrete. He's a wildly read columnist, Latino columnist. He's one of the biggest Latino columnists in the country. He's the most popular out there. He's nationally syndicated columnist with the Washington Post, which I happen to love, writer's group whose twice a week column appears in more than 100 newspapers, a member of the USA Today Board of Contributors, and a regular columnist for the Daily Beast. On television, Navarrete has appeared in dozens of shows and been interviewed by Bill O'Reilly, Anderson Cooper, Lou Dobbs, Bill Moyers, and others. Let's, uh, let's show you a little something about Ruben as a career. Take a look. My first impression of Ruben is this was a man with an opinion. When I got into Harvard College, he reached out to me, and it was not your typical recruitment phone call. It wound up being a two-hour phone call about politics, life, what's best for the Latino community. And if you know anything about Ruben, that should not come as a 
surprising. I think Ruben has developed a, a reputation for stirring thought in people from both sides of the political spectrum. Sometimes I think Ruben intentionally will choose a side that he may not even agree with himself, but he wants that dialogue. The email that I get a lot is an email that starts like this, I don't agree with you. I keep thinking one day I don't agree with you and I don't agree with you yet. But I read your column, and the reason I read your column is because you always make me think. And I don't think that, that it's special, I think it's in the job department. Because if you can see an argument, I don't care whether you're talking about immigration, or the election, or politics, or whatever, if you can see that issue from the other person's point of view, it's gonna make your 